Yeah. Yes. Grand. Because then everybody who doesn't appear, they can watch it. Um, so kia ora everybody. My name's Ari and my pronouns are they, them. I am the campaigns coordinator for Inside Out. And so I organized the campaigns this year. Um, welcome to your authors panel of 2022. I'm just going to start with a karakia and then I will hand over to Chelsea um, to sort of take the reins because she's much better at this than I am. Um, so if you know this karakia, you can join with me. If you don't, that's fine. So whakataka tiho ki te uru, whakataka tiho ki te tonga, ki a kina kina ki uta, ki a mā taratara ki tai, i he ake ana te ake atakura, he tio, he kuka, he hohu, humie, huie, taikie. Kia ora everybody. Um, ora. I will pass over to Chelsea. So hi everyone, um, I'm going to be moderating this today. So um, Ari originally asked me if I wanted to be on the panel. I said no, uh, because I am not an author. Uh, I am just an enthusiastic, slightly chaotic reader of books. Um, I run a bookstore called the Alphabet Book Club. You can see all my books behind me. I'm not actually in a closet. This is my office. It's just a little bit chaotic. <laughs> um, so I have a list of questions that I'm going to work my way through with the authors. Uh, if they start running over time, I'm going to give them a little wrapping up signal. Um, so that is why you might see me doing this every so often. It'll probably just mostly be at Helen. Um, <laughs> And uh, just for the just for the panel, what I'd ask is that you stay on uh, mute unless you're an author. If you have a question that you want to ask anybody, send a message directly to me in the chat. I'll have that up and running. Um, once we get through the list of pre-discussed questions that we've already sent to the authors, then I might open it up to you. If you've got a question and you feel comfortable asking it, I'll hand it over to you in that moment. Uh, is everyone cool with that? Say nothing. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So first up, we'll get the authors to introduce themselves, who they are, and the books that they've written. So I'm going to go clockwise in my screen, which is going to be different for everybody. But uh, Lil, you're up. Um, kia ora. I am Lil O'Brien, and I wrote uh, Not That I'd Kiss a Girl, which is um, a memoir um, about my about kind of all the stuff that comes oh there you go Chelsea's got it um alphabet book club uh which is a memoir about kind of like the, the period before I came out all the stuff that comes before you actually come out and the the back and forth and the am I allowed to swear on this panel the mess the mess the fuck ups and the and the triumphs and and you know um all that kind of messy stuff before you come out and then a little bit afterwards um set in kind of the early 2000s mostly in Otatahi and down at Otago University. Uh, it's a very Kiwi story and that's me. You are on mute, Chelsea. Thank you. Uh, what are your pronouns, Lil? Sorry, my pronouns are she, her. Awesome. Alrighty, gonna go down to SNX. Um, these books and they're both poetry books about identity and one is in first person and one is in third person <laughs> um yeah it's really great to be here all righty and what are your pronouns Issa? uh they um them or ear yeah. perfect all righty helen you're up hi for once that's not my dog barking um my name is helen I wrote this book. Um, I am also Takatapu, uh, bisexual in English. 
um, not bilingual, unfortunately, in any language at all. Um, I can't remember what else I meant to say. Hi. Oh, she, her, please. Perfect. All right. And Kerry. <laughs> Kia ora. Um, call Kerry a ho. My name's Kerry, and my pronouns are they, them. I'm non binary. Um, I'm blessed to have grown up in uh, North Waitaha, but I've lived in um, Rotorua and Te Whanganui Atara. I'm um, currently I'm in Ototahi. Um, I wrote a book, uh, a novel called Lamplighter, um, set in a um, small South Island coastal village. Um, and it's about um, queerness and um, and uh, yeah, living on living on the brink of wilderness, I guess. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I didn't mention in my introduction my my pronouns are she they. Um, I'm happy with either. I'm I'm pretty open about that. Uh, so we'll start with the questions that we were already sent through in advance, so the authors have some understanding of what they're getting into before we go a little bit off track. So first up is, what do you love about being an author? Uh, Issa, why don't you start us off? Um, well, I just love to write. So, <laughs> so that's the main thing. I think a lot of the bullshit around writing I find really difficult. Uh, <laughs> um, not, not this panel. I'll say it. <laughs> but um, but I, I just love to, like it, it's part of how I process the world and part of how I understand myself in the world. Um, and so it just feels essential and it's also a lot of fun to write. Um, so yeah, like just, I just love, <laughs> just love no, writing. That's very great. <laughs> All right, Helen, I saw you laughing at Essa's comments. It was true. It's funny because it's true. Um, I wrote down notes because I tend to get in front of people, uh, mainly Chelsea actually, and um, talk a lot. So I'm trying to make myself succinct. Okay, I wrote down, I don't know. <laughs> um, I've met a lot of cool people, including Chelsea. Uh, I like external validation. And there's a dopamine hit when I go into a bookstore. That's a good, that's a good thing to love about being an author. Kerry? I, yeah, I think um, I love being an author. Uh, because um, I love being part of like um, a local literary canon, I guess. It's like, it makes me feel really good. I like, I think one of my proudest achievements is um, being published in um, out, out Here, the um, Takatapui LGBTQIA plus anthology that was edited by um, Chris and Emma this last year. Um, yeah, that makes me feel really good about myself. Um, I like writing. I, I love what Issa said. Um, I think, you know, that that's, that helps me feel connected to the world around me. It's my conduit for connectedness and in the same way that, um, you know, like my queerness and my non-binary, you know, my gender helps me feel connected to the world around me. My relationship with um, with T. Tayal and um, the whenua that I grew up on. Okay, and Lil, over to you. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Kerry. Like it, it's for me been like a, a, it's felt like a really big achievement and it was super hard. <laughs> it's not easy. It took me a long time to, to write the book and I never thought that I would finish it. And then I never thought that I would publish it. Um, so I actually am quite, quite proud of myself and, and, um, the things that it's brought along with it, um, for me in particular, I've found, you know, writing a memoir, which is a book about myself, um, but, you know, a book where I'm kind of pretty, pretty open about things and um, it's, it's sparked a really amazing response from readers. I get like just the loveliest messages often um, and, and that makes me feel super good and like I've made a difference. Um, so that's probably been by far the most rewarding thing has been seeing that you know people people read it and they identify with things and they kind of feel seen in the book it's you just really can't beat that all right Lil, we'll stay with you so why did you pursue writing or well, what made you want to be a writer um I think I just 
kind of always um, did it. I, like some of the others said, I use it, I think, to process things that have happened. Um, I've, I've never been like much of a journal writer, but I did kind of, I would have always written down a lot of memories and, and captured, captured things and would write stories. But I, I guess I never really saw myself as a, um, as a creative writer. It was more, I used to kind of write about what I saw going on around me or write about my life. So um, it was kind of natural that I ended up writing a memoir, I guess. Um, yeah, and for me, I, I think there's a, there's a saying that's life can only be lived forwards but understood backwards. And that's how I feel when I write about things that have happened. It's, it helps me kind of understand them and connect them to being part of a bigger picture and, and process them. So that's one thing that I really love about writing. I also like the ritual of kind of going to a cafe or to a bar and sitting down and, you know, writing. It's nice. All right, Kerry, how about you? Same question. Um, I think... Uh partly why I love telling stories is that um, as um, my relationship with my father, probably with people in my family, uh, storytellers. Um, I think my dad, interestingly, is probably technically um, approaching illiteracy. He really struggled with um, reading and writing growing up, but he's um, a real um, passionate storyteller. And not only in terms of you know, like sitting around in a circle and telling stories, but um, he has a real strong relationship with um, the landscape. And I, you know, like I, I'm, dad and I are very different. He would take me hunting when I was a kid and I'm not much of a hunter, um, hunting and fishing, but, um, you know, he would tell a little stories on those trips. Um, and I think that, yeah, probably instilled in me a real love of storytelling, which is why I feel compelled to do it uh today or you know in my um growing up does that does that answer the question i, I feel yeah, like I've lost it, track does. Of it. it it shows passion like it, that's how it reads to me like passion is why you is what made you want to be an author yeah yeah Thank you. um Esther, how about you well, <clears throat> i think i don't know i think it was like validation from other people um that were like this thing is a good thing that you've done uh, and I was like oh okay and so I kept doing it um yeah but I think I think the reason for continuing to be an author changes a lot um like at the moment I write so that you know some some takatapui mukapuna like you know 100 years from now can like pick up my book and then be like this is embarrassing but it's good that it exists you know um yeah I don't know <laughs> that's my answer i love that i love that absolutely all right helen what don't worry, i don't know either <laughs> like pursue is entirely the wrong word for how this happened i would have been quite happy writing fan fiction for the rest of my life i think okay so we'll move on to our next question then did you go to uni what did you study would you recommend studying for creative writing I did go to uni um, twice, but I did not study creative writing. So I can't answer that question. I'm completely unqualified. What did you study? Uh, graphic design and then teaching. Awesome. How about you, Kerry? Did you go to uni? Um, yeah, I did. I, um, I went to, I, in 2006, I moved from um, Waitaha to Te Whanganui Atara to study at Toi Whakari, um, the National Drama School. It was doing performance design, which is set design and um, lighting design, costume design, which is a really nice landing pad for me. Um, but I found myself more and more interested in the scripts rather than, um, than doing the design. Um, so after two years, I dropped out. Um, and I worked for a little while and then I um, clumsily uh, finished my undergrad at Vic, um, mostly in English Lit. Uh, but during that time, I um, did some undergrad papers at the IIML, which I um, totally, like, I, you know, I hadn't had that experience before in study where I just felt absolutely gripped by what I was doing. And um, those stories made up my um, 
my uh, portfolio or my application portfolio for the master's program, which um, was a really important year for me at the, yeah, at the IIML, at the International Institute of Modern Leaders. But, um, you know, like I, I feel like education is such a, um, can be a really difficult thing to navigate for people. And, you know, it's a real privilege that I was able to um, uh, attend study. I mean, I paid for it, but um, I'm not sure if I'd necessarily recommend it. Like, you know, my, like I said, my dad has um, really struggled with literacy and he's one of the most important storytellers to me in my life. So there, you know, like there are 5,000 different ways to tell stories. Um, and there are lots of less expensive ways um, than going to uni. But, you know, my, my uni experience was really important to me for sure. It's definitely one of those things that's good for everyone to decide whether it works for them. What do you reckon, Lil? Um, yes, uh, there's a lot of, about my experience at Otago Uni in my book. Um, it was more drinking than studying. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I did, a, did a degree down there in psychology and communications. Um, and then I decided that I wasn't ready to grow up and get a job. So I um, applied to go to advertising school, uh, which was at Media Design School up in um, Auckland. Uh, which still goes today and teaches all kinds of awesome things like 3D animation and motion graphics and things like that. Um, but, you know, I could have got into the advertising course without having been to uni. It was all about the portfolio of, of work that you put together and it didn't have to be published things or whatever. So I just had bits of writing or just some ideas and things like that. So I kind of agree with Kerry that there are lots of different ways you can come to things. And then writing has always just been something I've done on the side. Um, the book was definitely written on the side. I started when I was about 25 maybe, and I would just, um, you know, plod away at it every now and again and in the mornings and the evenings or go to a bar and have a drink and, and write some of it. So um, that I was never formally trained in how to do that, but um, uh, I did end up coming out of advertising school um, as an advertising copywriter. So I think um, some of that background um, definitely uh, it doesn't teach you how to write a book, but it informed um, my writing style, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, copywriting, which is, you know, can be all kinds of things as well, but it's generally writing for brands and businesses. It's um, about plain English and, and accessibility, you know, writing really simply and clearly. And I think that's reflected in the way that, you know, I write in my own tone of voice as well. It's a good companion, um, like in ways into writing. How yeah. about you, Issa? Did you go to uni? <laughs> I'm I'm still at uni so hey. <laughs> you know um oh god I could talk for an hour about my feelings about uni but I'm not going to um I'd be giving you the signal <laughs> yes uh so I yeah I did some creative writing papers in undergrad um and that was like really important um under Tracy Slaughter um at Wakato Uni um and yeah I would say that was like a really good time <laughs> and then um yeah and then I went to and did my master's uh in creative writing at um yeah the IIML um and that was I don't know I was mostly depressed for that whole year so I can't really speak to that experience very well <laughs> um and then yeah and now I'm currently doing a PhD uh looking at um writing by Takatapui writers and how they engage with uh, technology and that's really cool but um I do I do want it to be feel like there are more pathways into writing and into connecting with publishers because that's like one of the things about being at a university is that you get into rooms with people who who you know know someone who knows a publisher and that's like actually really important to getting your work out there um you know you have to do the work but then it's also knowing people um so yeah I, I I I don't know I feel I feel mixed about recommending these things because like university is also incredibly racist environments um you know we we can't forget the kind of you know the institutional biases that exist and the things that are built you know colonial things that are built on this land um but yeah I I do think there is a lack of of um 
inroads. accessible inroads. pathways out, outside of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, it is very much up to <laughs> the individual. Um, yeah, everybody you know. thrives in different environments, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'll start. I'll, co I'll continue talking with you, Issa. Just unmute yourself. Um, how does being queer or rainbow or takatapoi influence your writing? Uh, whoa. <laughs> um, they're like inseparable, I guess. Like I, I found my queerness, or like how to articulate my queerness through poetry, essentially. Like there were, you know, I like knew certain things about myself, but like you're like, oh, well, it doesn't mean I'm this or that. Um, but then. Yeah, there's a um, poet called Coda Rose Cleverdance, who's a non-binary poet from America, who wrote a book called Beast Feast. And I read that book and was like, how'd they get away with that? And then that like, I like had already come to some words and, and ideas about my identity, but that like kind of, I don't know, there's something that poetry can do or writing can do that like kind of lets, um, I compare it to meeting a new friend as you get an opportunity to actually grow and become a different person um with with writing and I feel like that's what my connection between <laughs> queerness and writing is it like gives you a chance to start again or to become something new every time you engage with it or do it um yeah. I love that I love that so much um Kiri how does being queer rainbow or takataboi influence your writing I uh, used said it really well um you know like, like and maybe like I said earlier also it's um kind of like my coordinates like my relationship with Te Taiao like with that um uh with my uh, in the same way that you know like that's how I navigate through the world like my relationship with like nature and um with my gender and you know as in my relationship is with myself as a storyteller <laughs> like it, it's just yeah how um yeah, I, it's like kind of like the air that I breathe, I guess. So, so it influences your writing heavily then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lil? Um, yeah, I guess I just find it the most interesting thing and the most interesting people to write about. Um, you know, I, I have written a lot kind of you know non-fiction about myself and so it's inherent in that and um, I've kind of discovered that things about not just my sexuality but my my parents and my upbringing is just starts to creep into any topic that I <laughs> write um, and and that's that's a good a good thing um, for you know for my sexuality I think it's really important and it's really important to me and um, I want to only write about things are meaningful and important to me um you know, i think uh i like kind of writing that's observation about the world and i'm trying to write something at the moment and it's almost like trying to force straight characters in it for me i'd rather yeah. just you know and, and to write about straight straight people in the way that's not kind of taking the piss a little bit um i'm not sure if i'm going to achieve that but it's fun i i, I kind of I, <laughs> yeah yeah uh I so, love yeah. that you've got like your token cis hits as opposed to your token gays. So you're like, I uh, love it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so yeah, I'm still exploring that. There's just there's just so much to explore. It's it's great. Okay, chucking it down to our other Takatapoi author, Helen. Oh, um, I don't know. I've never been straight, so I don't know what the comparison is. It, uh, Do you think it influences your writing though? I don't know. I have no point of comparison. <laughs> Compared to what? Um, it makes me more stubborn to be authentic, I think, mm -hmm. because of how society views all of that. So if everyone's like, oh, I don't know if we can put this conversation about lube in your book, I'm like, are we allowed to swear? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I'm going to fucking put it in anyway. So you can just deal with it. <laughs> People need to know about lube. It's important. It's very important. I agree. Um, okay, Kerry, we'll start with you this, for this one. What's your favorite genre to read and write? Um, I I think um, science fiction and fantasy or um, science fiction and fantasy adjacent writing um, I find really interesting. Um, I'm not so much into high fantasy or uh, is high science fiction a thing. Um, I, um, I also really love like, 
like I'm nature writing, I um, love short fiction. Oh no, Siri thinks I'm talking to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I think, does my science fiction exist <laughs> <laughs> I think like if I had to choose one it would be like sci-fi adjacent kind of writing I find sci-fi really um, fun and interesting and yeah yeah uh, the way that they describe the whole sci-fi fantasy genre as speculative fiction like mm. the kind of what if fiction so yeah I like that as well that's all sorry so that's like what you is it your favorite genre to read and write no i was just bunning in okay well tell us your answer to the question then i don't like reading yuck books um i don't know i like writing smart to be honest and um you're not allowed to do that for a children's publisher so yeah I, that's why you write fan fiction yeah. all right well uh, that was the dog, by the way, if anybody heard that, that thump. Sorry. <laughs> She's only young. She doesn't know that walls are hard and you shouldn't fall on them. <laughs> oh, am I supposed to answer? Yeah. No, answer <laughs> Is it my turn? It you, <laughs> um, yeah, I think I just like a bit of everything except for fantasy I'm not so much um into that I, you know I skirt the edges of it in, in my reading but um yeah I just I, I do like a good um post-apocalyptic kind of story uh and some science fiction I like YA and um memoir and just all, all kinds of things I, I I like um distinctive voices and um yeah all kinds of all kinds of things really and you know I just read the latest Marion Keys book and I'm not I'm not ashamed of it enjoyed it you know, so I, I like all the, you know, the mainstream should, stuff and all kinds of things. You should never be ashamed of the books no. that you read. I find that idea of people shaming people for books horrific. Yeah. Um, how about you, Issa? Favorite uh, genre? Uh, well, yeah, I'm not sure it was a genre, but I mostly read poetry uh, and experimental poetry um, at that. But then even just experimental poetry by Māori writers <laughs> tends to be <laughs> tends to be where I um, kind of hang out a lot because um, you know uh, it doesn't get really doesn't really get enough attention so I'm like over here trying to <laughs> be the what is it, spiders spiders Greg or whatever trying to trying to skew the like statistics and <laughs> and how how much we talk about Takatapu writing um yeah but I sometimes I'd like I don't know I I I'm yeah, I I started reading like through Star Wars novels. Oh wow! So, like I have like eighty Star Wars novels at my nan's house that I'm supposed to be getting rid of at some point. No, no, <laughs> don't get rid of them. You have to keep oh. them forever. <laughs> Mine are like pre prequels, so they've all been decanoned. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I've got like, like four copies of Split like Admiral and Admiral Knight. Thrawn and shit, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah he yeah. was such a creep. Oh my god. All right, um, all right. I'm gonna derail this. All right, I'm gonna move on to our next question. Um, Kerry, I'm looking forward to your answer to this one. How do you come up with your ideas? Oh um gosh, I'm not sure if I can um how do I come up with my ideas? I think um that's such a difficult question. I, I hardly know how to answer it. I'm, I, I think I, I read <laughs> um, and I um like I, I read a lot of Wikipedia. Um, my lamplighter came about um, from a conversation with my grandmother, actually. Uh, and it's pretty safe to say that um, neither of my grandparents are go going to watch this, but um, she told me something about my grandfather, which was really terrible, um, a really terrible thing to find out as a, um, as a queer person. And um, it really upset me. And um, somehow, like, that kind of crystallized into like the um, seed that became lamplighter um, like a um, the the central character in lamplighter is um, draws heavily from my grandfather and you know I have a like a um, he's a very complicated person um, and yeah yeah so I'm I, you know like I'm, I'm not a very prolific writer like, in fact it's pretty much lamplighter but um, that that came about from processing some pretty hard news, actually. Yeah. 
yeah i feel like that ties in similar to lil with your book is would you say that's fair yeah i mean yeah the book my book is um yeah it definitely helped me to process um things that happened with my coming out because my my you know the hook of my book is the opening chapter is my parents finding out that i was gay and telling me to get out of the house and they never wanted to see me again um so but I don't like to think that the book's actually about that it's it's not you know that's that's the hook for, that's the hook but it's not um it's the focus isn't on them because you know I don't want to put the focus on them but yes it is a, a book about um yeah what, what it was like to be finding yourself and celebrating in yourself at the same time as as someone finds out something about you your sexuality and absolutely tries to tear you apart um for for being that so that kind of dichotomy and the the struggle um to be like yeah fuck yeah I'm gay you know at the same time that someone's um you know um you're kind of losing your family for the same reasons Hmm. um so with the books that you've written do you like to answer that question how do you come up with ideas do you base it off your personal experiences I mean, it's hard. That's a hard one for me to answer because I have just written um, the, my memoir, and, and that's it. Um, and, and that was kind of a burning, a burning need to to capture things that had happened and to write them down and make sense of them, add a narrative to it. So there was kind of no question that that's what I was eventually going to write, even though I didn't think that I would ever be able to finish it. Um, now that I've kind of passed that and, and thinking, okay, maybe I can actually manage to write, like maybe I'm actually half half good, um, <laughs> then then I'm going to, you know, I'm kind of exploring doing some fiction. And, and to be honest, like ch- choosing an idea is hard for me. I'm a little bit um, like Helen. I've written um, a, some fan fiction and fan fiction is, um, you know, my first love and it's very char- character driven it's all about the characters and so that's generally where I start when I do ideas I I draw from my friends um, and people that I meet and they have the characters and then I kind of go oh I could add some plot I guess mm-hmm. um, so. <laughs> okay yeah. so that leads me down to Helen are you the same where um, ideas come from oh fuck knows um everywhere I have ADHD so like literally everywhere and my brain's like la things um and I'm a bit of a dialogue vampire and I work with a bunch of teenagers so it's actually really easy hi Roman yeah ADHD buddies I love that (laughs) um Issa how about you where do your ideas come from yeah I think it's much the same like I don't I don't put much stock in ideas mostly because well I'm a poet and I just need a first line and then the ideas (laughs) come from writing the rest of the poem right I also feel that way about Scribe Jane fiction Austen. I've tried or like short fiction I've like written but like mostly in private um I just think yeah like the ideas are just already in the world and mostly a thing is good based on the execution of the idea so I don't I don't know I focus mostly on executing something well rather than like thinking about a brilliant idea <laughs> Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. All right, Helen, what, what what did you jump in with? I can't remember. Okay, great. No. Um, we'll st- okay, well, then we'll keep with you, Helen. Do you have any tips for young writers? Fan fiction. Yep. Wow. Okay. All of it. <laughs> um, because published authors do still read it and write it, and you don't know who they are because they're never going to tell you their AO3 handles. So um, what's yeah. your AO3 handle? Never going to tell you. Worth a shot. Uh, (laughs) Kerry, do you have have any tips for young writers? Um, Yeah, I guess this is another really um, complicated question, but I I guess one thing that I would say is to not like doubt your own perspective on something. I think like the most interesting writing is when someone has a perspective. So obviously like all of us here, and you know, like no matter what kind of your art form is, is that you're drawing on, um, uh, you know, like it's really important to read other um, authors and to um, to develop a sense of what you want to write about. 
But um, yeah, I would really encourage young authors or like old authors, like new authors, to um, to to not to have confidence in their own perspective uh, on something. I I think but you don't fake it. Yeah. Yeah. Authenticity. Yeah. yeah. Authenticity. Yeah. How uh, Lil, what do you think? Any tips for young writers? Uh, I just, I mean, read lots. Definitely read lots and read lots of different styles and, you know, try and find where you want to be within that and play with things. And I think just also don't worry too much about being an author. Like it's yeah. authors, just just a title and, 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 you know, being published by a, by a publisher or self, self-publishing that's, you know, amazing, but it's not, you shouldn't rest your valida- validation on that. Like you, you can be a writer if you're just you know writing in your journal or whatever just as long as you're you know enjoying it or you're getting something out of it or it's challenging you um yeah I, I don't think you have to achieve anything in a certain amount of time or follow a certain path it's just find find the parts of it that, that you love to do and yeah explore explore your voice and explore what you have to say a bit like what Kerry said I love in the chat everybody's sharing their AO3 handles I think that's incredible <laughs> so good um Issa any tips well, I think you're, you've done a really good thing, like, at coming to this panel, even, like, watching it later or whatever, is because I think finding community is, like, the number one thing to keep writing. And, like, the thing, you know, like, most people don't, don't get anywhere because they stop because the world is, like, you know, hell-bent on stopping you from writing because it's not, like, viable in all these certain ways but it's incredibly enjoyable and necessary um in in a whole lot of other ways and so finding community finding people who get you finding people you can be like ah you know that 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 publisher didn't publish my thing and you can just like both bitch about it like yeah just finding other people who also do writing um and at the same level that you're at as well yeah yeah. So you don't want to be sitting there going, oh, well, this person got this and this person got this and they started like 10 years before you. Yeah, and feeling, feeling comfortable, uh, you know, yeah. with the people and the level that you're all on, yeah. Um, I think the thing that made the biggest difference to me continuing to write and being very, very willing to go back and edit was finding friends in the fandom that I was in that were willing to stick around. We made our own cool kid crew um, even though we weren't big name fans and we were like oh my god they're so amazing um turns out they weren't and we were mm. Did not helen, helen are you going to at least tell us you know what your you know what your texts are that you write what your yeah what you are you fan fiction what are you what fandom are you a part of uh i got Fandoms. my masters in drary <laughs> <laughs> most people who've read this could probably have guessed um it is secretly based on a piece of fan fiction that i wrote and adored um and then i saw the ad for the ampersand prize and i'm like i don't really think i can write a book in six weeks um but i could adapt something what have i got and i'm like nothing it's all adults um, and I'm like, well, that I could, hmm. and I found the one that I'd written that I could adapt. And I was like, you know, I could do that in six weeks. I'm just changing the names. And then I realized that it was massive undertaking and I was an idiot. Um, but I wanted to stick to my tiny little hyper fixation of I'll get this thing done by the due date. And I think I handed it in at 11 o'clock at night or just after 11 and the cutoff was at 12. So I feel like that kind of answered part of our next question, which is how do you complete your projects? So you actually, Chelsea. (laughs) So um, Chelsea. (laughs) For everyone here, I'm Helen's beta reader. um, And I am type A and very hyper organized. So I um, will sit there and be like, next and next and next and next. She sends me tiny little sad emoji faces. (laughs) <laughs> like I can't believe you're doing this to me what happens I'm like I actually don't know anymore because I haven't written the next book what are you worried about okay like, so don't tell them and I'm like excellent idea <laughs> okay so Helen needs me how about you Carrie how do you finish your books um I mean often I often I don't finish my projects um I start I start a lot of things I think um that's not very useful though I think um, it's, with, it's valid and true though yeah. and you will know when you want to finish something and you're instinctively you'll go okay this isn't working 
I'll spend my time and energy elsewhere. And I think that's fine. And you shouldn't be ashamed. Hmm. I, you know, like, uh, I think what helped me um, finish Lamp Platter was that I was enrolled in study and that I spent a lot of money on, on that master's. Um, uh, I think probably what helps me complete, you know, like I, I work for Manaki Fenua at the moment and I have to, um, like weekly, I have to write articles um, based on kind of research papers and some of which I find really challenging. Um, and I, I think what really helps me finish you know, meet those deadlines is getting out of the house and maybe going to Burger King or like, um, like uh, Turanga or something. And, um, you know, like getting out of my room and writing that that's helpful some of the time. Yeah. Yep. Mental health walk, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, how about you, Essa? Is it similar with your study? Does that drive uh, projects? Yeah, well, I guess for Ransack, my first collection of poetry, it had to be done in nine months. So, yeah. Uh, but then for the follow-up, I took like four years, <laughs> um, four or three years. Uh, I don't know. I, I Deadlines are really important in regards to smaller projects. Um, for things that are bigger, it's just like you hit a point or, you know, your editor's like, we're, we're going to send it to the printer. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah I don't know it's it's really interesting I like to think that I haven't finished anything like it's all incomplete in some ways like there, there is something there are like poems in both of my books that I could finish and like I, I feel like they're incomplete but I think that's good for me to to have it as like this kind of I don't know it it just is a thing that I left <laughs> I like um let go of um because I don't think you can really complete anything. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I really like that. But that's how like series, that's how books become series that just keep growing, like because an author feels like they need to keep going. I love they that. They get harassed by their readers. Yes. Um, Lil, how about you? How do you com complete your projects? Um, I, I guess I kind of work in like a few different fields and each of them is different. So in my day-to-day -day work as a copywriter, it's very deadline driven and I'm a freelancer. So there's a fear of, you know, not doing a good job or letting someone down and not being hired and not being able to pay my bills. So that's, you know, the motivation is, is there to be, to, to be good. And I have to finish things daily or, or weekly. And, and so it's very deadline driven. Um, when I was writing Not That I'd Kiss a Girl, it was just me, you know, in my, at my desk in one of my flats. And then it was finished when I was living in New York, sitting in a bar. So it was just kind of me writing into the void. You know, I didn't have any publisher or anyone putting pressure on me apart from myself. And it was really just kind of sheer determination, I think. Um, and maybe as I started getting further and further through, I started going, okay, well, this is actually... I'd read back and think this actually sounds quite good or, or then I'd be like wow I've actually written you know a third of the chapters or wow I could see I could see the end so it was it was very much self motiv self motivated and I and as I think I've said like building a kind of ritual around writing so it was like well look you might not feel like it but you're gonna treat you know you go out and sit at a bar or sit at a cafe and your reward for writing is that you have a nice coffee or have a have a beer or something um so kind of motivate myself yeah. through rewards sorry my kids never rewarded myself with alcohol that's <laughs> but the problem is you know for me it's like i sh shouldn't be the same as young people but it's like the first drink is great but if you try and have a second drink then you you lose the plot that yeah, lose the plot literally <laughs> like, yeah lose yeah, lose the plot and lose the writing skills um, but then there are other times of types of writing that you know you're collaborating um, mm. uh, with with people like if you're doing if you want to get into screenwriting or writing for TV and stuff um, that's like sitting in a room brainstorming with people and and then you kind of you write it together at the time so there's just so many different ways you think you have to find what what works for you mm -hmm. in the situation. So this will be an interesting question for you, Lil, with our next one. Um, because your work is mostly memoir based, although you were talking about characters before. So tell us about your favorite character that you've written. Um, well, yeah, I haven't really written any characters apart from I do think that, you know, when you're writing, when you write a memoir and you're writing about real people, they're still a character. Yeah. Um, because you're, you're picking and choosing the parts of them that you want to 
you know, display on the page and to, to, to highlight and you're, you're cobbling together a character that you present to, to people um, that's elements of them, but it is very much your own creation. Um, so uh, I don't know. I just, I don't know if I have a, a favorite character. I, I think that I just like to think that when I write about people, even if I, even if they haven't been the nicest or whatever that you write about, about them with love and you kind of capture something nice about them or some kind of distinctive character, mm -hmm. um, some, some kind of something distinctive about their character. Um, so yeah, I don't think I have a, a particular favorite character, but that's, that's what I like. I kind of like thinking about a real person going, what, what are the interesting things about you that I want to talk about? <laughs> Is it similar with poetry, Essa? Like, do you consider people that you write about characters? Uh, well, I literally turned people that I care about into characters yeah. in my mo most recent book. So, like, Excellent. um, so yeah, like, I, uh, but then also, yeah, I've taken, um, like, art and, and figures from Greek mythology and, like, turned them into my own characters. So, like, uh i really like the spider in echidna um she's just kind of like well i guess she's technically a spider person but it's like really kind of like staunch tenoranga teresanga vibes um and prometheus i really liked writing my version of prometheus um and this kind of like being post the torture and post like being this like kind of rebellious figure and like kind of thinking about who he was and how he's like kind of being cowed now. And it's, it was kind of a sad character, but it was, it was nice to write and it was fun to explore characters in poetry. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Kerry, do you have a favorite character? Um, I, yeah, like I said, Lamplighter draws on um, a lot of uh, my family. So I, I'm not sure if I, um, you know, some of those characters are pretty complicated for me, but um, in my master's year, uh, I'm not sure if Issa would have had the same prompt in poetry, but we um, one of the like kind of prompts at the start of the year where we had to we had a week to come up with something. I wrote this like weird kind of post-apocalyptic um, fable, and um, there's this like young girl at the edge of a pond, and she's looking to the water, and these various kind of creatures kind of approach her. And there was this like nasty little monkey who spoke in kind of really contrived, like bad French, um, who, um, who just kind of lives rent free in my head a little bit. Like I, I have a real soft spot for that weird evil little monkey for some reason. I don't even know why. <laughs> I love that. I love it so much. Um, Helen, favorite character? They chose a spider and a monkey, so I'm going to say Megan, who is an egg. Yeah. <laughs> so Megan's a golden egg. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love That's it. Adorable. I love that it's not like literal human characters. I love that. Um, okay. So the next question up is, do you study the books that you read? Do you take notes and do you annotate? Um, Lil, we'll start with you. Um, I definitely pull out not lovely passages or, or quotes or things that I that I love from pieces of writing. Sometimes way too long, and then I've got lots and lots of books full of passages from books and quotes. And it wasn't until you know I'd been doing that for about fifteen years that I was like, damn, I should be doing this in a digital format so that I can actually then search, you know, for, for the things because it's like a lot of going through old journals and trying to find these amazing pieces of writing. Um, yeah, but my, um, my step kid actually, um, it's quite cute. They, they read a book with their boyfriend and they read the book at the same time and they annotate it and make put post-its and then they swap the books um, and then read each other's annotations, which I find super That's cute. So cute. Um, so yeah, I'm into that. And actually, one of the nicest things my my girlfriend um, read my book for like the second or third time, and she went through and put post-it notes on all the. We started dating like about five months before my book came out, so she was there at kind of when I'd got the publishing deal, and so we didn't know each other super well. So she went through the book and put post-it notes through all the parts that and put lots of comments and questions and it was kind of a way of getting to know me and that was also like a really really super cute thing to do I thought it's a love language yeah 
yeah. I've had a bunch so. of my students got a arc copy of my book and well, actually there was I think there was about three arcs that went around my senior classes because the, the younger classes weren't allowed to read it because there is a parental advisory on it <laughs> um but they left me little post-it notes in there about things and it was just the most precious thing in the world yeah and sometimes all they were writing was oh <laughs> <laughs> like oh cute seeing how and like one of them came in with this like scrap paper that had tiny tiny writing on it and it was all like page numbers and like tiny little notes about it and it was it was wonderful and then they would talk about it in front of me and I'm like oh the dream <laughs> so do you annotate your own books Helen no no I analyze them and rarely finish them <laughs> I, I ruin them by thinking about them too much like a fucking designer and um yeah I I have oddly this one does have notes in it and I actually can't remember what any of them are for the only other book I've ever annotated was Henry Hamlet's Heart and that's because I know the author and she made a typo <laughs> um how about you Kerry do you annotate your work no <laughs> I just don't I don't even really have anything interesting to say about it I um maybe I should uh occasionally I'll write notes in my phone if um if I if there's something that I you know want to come back to or um really speaks to me but otherwise no how about you Issa what's the question again I got a bit lost it's okay do you do you study the the books that you do you study the books that you read and do you take notes and annotate them right um I don't tend to annotate so much but I, I there are like a whole lot of things I have to uh do this with because I'm you know currently Study. WPhD <laughs> yeah. um but I and I think I don't I, it's been a long time yeah I don't know if I do that with this just text I'm reading for joy I usually just read them out loud um to myself like the poetry books I read I yeah just enjoy how they sound on the air rather than thinking too much about them um yeah I don't know but yeah, yeah it's part of like an academic practice more than like my personal know, choice I, yeah 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 <laughs> okay Helen I can see you've got your hand up which is adorable no I had a question for Essa um if you find a poem that you really like do you like learn it by heart so you can keep it forever I so I had I had to learn one of my own poems by heart for like a performance um in Brisbane the other day and that's the first time I've like memorized something in a long time um but it made me it made me want to do that with other poems mm. because then you can feel it in your body in a way that you wouldn't otherwise and so yeah I'm like I'm like a big fan of um there's a First Nations writer called Jazz Money and she wrote a book called How to Make a Basket so I'm planning <laughs> I want to memorize one of her poems because she like her work got me through quarantine. <laughs> yeah. Relatable. I like the idea of absorbing art. It's kind of like a tattoo, being able to remember a poem and go back to it whenever you want. Like I've memorized, and it's fading now in my old age, but I memorized the Jabberwocky when I was like 13. And I was like, I'm never going to be able to remember all this crap. But you can because there's a rhythm and some things rhyme and I had the Jabberwocky in my head for you know 30 years now almost 25 and it's just got such a cool rhythm still and I can still picture the time on the bus going between my normal high school who didn't have technology classes we were driving to the local intermediate to do like woodwork or something back when woodwork existed and I remember hanging over the back of a bus seat with my friend trying to remember this poem because we've been told we had to remember it and I had gone I'm never gonna be able to do that um but I actually did and it's just stayed with me forever I love the idea of it like living in your heart I think yeah. that's so precious I think the only poem that I can remember but off the top of my head is um hope is the thing with feathers by Emily Dickinson oh that is like yeah. I love it um okay so when you're writing do you listen to music or do you or white noise or anything like that I'm gonna start I play with, playlists I'm gonna start with you Helen 
Spotify playlists. I make playlists for the book based on the vibe that I want. And it helps me flesh out the characters by choosing songs that are significant to them and like inventing why they might be significant. Yeah. So the one I'm writing at the moment has, it's got a, there's a soundtrack for the two of them together. And then I'm like, these two music styles do not go together, which is why this whole romance is surprising. Um, so I made them two separate playlists and then expanded upon them a bit more because the one with just both of them was like, what is this sort of, yeah. So yeah, I, I have specific playlists, though I do like to put the sound of crackling fires over things. Um, one of the massive fanfics I wrote, I say massive, it was only 85K, um, that had a lot of crackling fireplace over early 2000s ballads. Um, and it has its own playlist as well. Only 85K, just casually only 85K. <laughs> yeah. um, well, well, how, about you? how about you? Do you write with music? <laughs> No, I can't, definitely can't write with music, like, and yeah, no, and I, but, but then I actually, because I wrote a lot of, of the book um, in, like, bars, and I wrote, and, like, I got used to that kind of noise of people being around you, so sometimes, even, even in my work, you know, that I do, um, I, which is, which is usually silent, sometimes I need to get out and work around people, but not have to engage with them. So I like that kind of background, like noise. ambient noise. Ambient noise, and I but I could, I've I've worked in like a like bars at happy hour in New York. Kind of, I, I've surprised myself with how much I can kind of tune out when you really get into it. But if you put a put music on, then I'm done. Like, cannot concentrate at all. Mm -hmm. What if it's classical? <sighs> if you test it out, it's probably 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 better. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like Classics or like slow jazz with the crackling fireplace or like rain sounds. Yeah. Really soothing. Like crackling fireplace. I like the sound of, I listen to that at night sometimes to help me sleep. There's yeah. a YouTube one that is just like a video as well of a crackling fireplace. It goes like 12 hours. Mm. It's amazing. Okay. It sounds good. I'll try that for sure. Okay. How about you, Kerry? Do you listen to music when you write? I'm not music, but I'm a, um, I'm a total slut for ASMR. So I like, I listen to, um almost everything like people operating on me as if I'm a robot or um like people folding laundry uh I'm probably like Lil I'm I am really productive when I'm um like and maybe this has something to do with queerness if we if we want to like really analyze it but um you know like growing up I kind of felt like a spectacle everywhere I went like I like I didn't fit in like I was like projecting the kind of like, um, so, like I found like, yeah, like I was a real spectacle. So as an adult, fi feeling more content in public places has been a real victory for me. So I, um, I, I find a lot of contentment in like libraries or at the gym when people are around me focused on their own thing and I'm focused on my thing. So often when I'm working, I'll listen to like a cafe noise. Mm. Um, or things like that you know, yeah that, that's probably my go-to for when I'm writing I love that you understand why you like and why you thrive in that those environments instead of just oh I like them you you've delved into why I love that so much yeah I've been thinking about it a lot lately in terms of um one of like in, in terms of maintaining good mental health for me um one of the things that I really love doing is going to the gym and you know, partly it's feeling like I'm in control of my own body. That that feels really nice. But also I am, yeah, I've recognized that it is really nice to be in a kind of a crowded place and not to feel awful. Mm. And yeah, that feels really nice for me as an adult. Okay, Issa, how about you? Do you listen to music when you write? So I have like some practices that I do, but like there's doesn't tend to be like any one thing all the time but um recently I've just been listening to like the most arranged type of pop I can find really loudly while while writing this story I'm working on <laughs> um yeah I just like I really like loud music and I like things that like uh I don't know maybe it's the kind of like falling asleep to CSI that my nan doesn't know I can see in the reflection of the cabinet um for yeah, most of my like childhood <laughs> so just being like over you know over processing everything uh while I'm supposed to be 
uh, you know, getting to sleep yeah. <laughs> um, means that I just need a lot of noise <laughs> to focus. I used to fall asleep to Tracy Chapman all the time when I was a kid. And I finally got to see her in concert and it was just like a religious experience. It was <laughs> bizarre. Like the way that, like my whole self reacted to being right in front of her while she's singing and thinking back to being like seven. And it was, it was really trippy and awesome. And I love how music brings back memories like that and has like that whole vibe. And as soon as you turn it up and it's all you can hear, and this could be linked to the ADHD, I'm thinking now, you have to hear it. You can't not, and there's nothing else. And it's, I find it a really nice way to focus on nothing else rather than focus on the music. Yeah, because you're, fill you're filling your brain with something. Yeah. I, I like, it. Look, I'm going to turn this up really loud, occupy all of the tiny little voices, and they go, ah! and then the, the writer in the back somewhere can actually get some work done. Yeah. Your ADHD and my ADHD present in two very different ways, though. So, <laughs> um, okay. So, next one, writer's block. How do you get through it? Um, Kerry, we'll start with you. Um, I, I think, I feel like maybe I've kind of, I'm just going to double up on an answer. Often though, I don't get through writer's block, but um, like getting out of the house, uh, like changing my setting. Um, Oh, actually, maybe um, this is something that I may be bad at doing, but I've had recommended to me, and when I have done it, it's been useful, um, is to do something like if you're struggling with a character or struggling to know where to go next in a narrative, just to like pick any random thing, like have a character, like go and pick apples, like write like a page of them at an orchard picking apples or like accidentally ste stepping on a duckling or something and feeling really bad or just like pick anything and like and spend 20 minutes writing that um and it you know might give you an insight into like where you want to go next in terms of your narrative does that make stepping sense on a duckling <laughs> I'm well, you know like just <laughs> as a full <laughs> experiment <laughs> my goodness <laughs> maybe picking apples i should have stuck with picking apples <laughs> washing the dishes I like the idea of them doing something mundane. I annoy Helen because all I want is epilogues and I want the epilogue of the, the, the couple doing cute mundane things. Spoiler alert, what if there's no couple at the end, Chelsea? Jesus. <laughs> is there ever not a couple at the end? Um, okay, uh, Helen, how do you get through writer's block? I don't really get writer's block. Sorry, everyone. Um, but at least- well, you're not gonna be any use. Well, Lou, how do you get through writing this book? <laughs> you let me finish. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> um, I have read some advice years ago, and I found that if I'm stuck somewhere, it's because I fucked up like 10 lines above that, and I've gone in the wrong direction. So the first thing I do when I write this book is I highlight, like I find out where I had a choice last, and I highlight everything below it, cut it, put it in another document, and then start again doing something else. And it seems to fix it every time. Mm. Um, otherwise it's the signal that I'm extremely depressed it's that's very good advice and self-realization at the same time um, um antidepressants helped I haven't had writer's block since I definitely get bored of stories and don't want to write them anymore but I don't think that's the same thing you just same thing yes words <laughs> calm it, it was the duckling it's still getting <laughs> duckling um Lil how about you how do you get your writer's block um I think like there are times when I know that just just sit down in front of your computer like and and read back a little bit and at least like I think the, the most important thing is don't be too hard on yourself and don't beat yourself up and get wound up about it because that definitely really it's a little bit like when you can't sleep in the moment you start getting angry about that or thinking about there's no way you're gonna sleep um so I think I've like I try and be easy on myself if I don't feel like it but then also some days like go on just just sit down there and you know have a coffee and have a look at what you've done and something might come and I have found that sometimes if I force myself to kind of um to to do that then it starts to roll um a bit a bit more um but yeah I'm, I'm not particularly disciplined um I'm very much kind of um do it when you feel like it or, but I, I would like to get more of a discipline I think that would that would also probably help me get around writer's block and, and also because I think I haven't written a lot of fiction um I don't really have much of an experience with um 
you know, not really knowing what a character is going to do next or the plot. Um, I think when you when I was writing um, my memoir, it was more about like because I had when you write a memoir, you kind of have to uncover a lot of um, things that you that have happened to you and really process them and think about them, and that can be really really um, a lot of emotional labour. So um, that you know there are times you had to learn when to be easy easy on yourself and I would just sometimes for example pick if I was in a in a mood like we're in a particular a particular mood I was ready to tackle that stuff then I would do that but if I wasn't in that mood then I would go and write one of the funny uh, anecdotes up Mm. so I would just kind of jump around um, depending on the mood that I was in as well to what piece that I would write that's my study style as well like Mm. if you bog down with one you jump to the next one and you just kind of shake it up a bit yeah Uh, if they how about you writer's block um uh, I don't really yeah I think I'm a bit like Helen <laughs> um I play with just, poetry you can just write down fuck a lot and then eventually yeah you, well you want to say fuck you too and then you've got a poem you like nailed it I think I'm also just always working on like many different projects mm. um so yeah, if I like on them with other projects yeah I just just go go somewhere else if I feel I don't know I just really enjoy writing uh yeah and and also I'm aware that my editor self can save me in the future Mm -hmm. um so I so Mm -hmm. (laughs) so I'm kind of like not that stressed about the first draft um which helps a lot I think in terms of just putting stuff down yeah I'm like this whole conversation is probably fucked but like (laughs) oh well I'll, I'll, I'll make it work you know later on (laughs) when I have like a sense for how all the pieces are fitting, right? Yeah. You can't edit nothing, right? Yeah, exactly. As long as it's down, you've got <laughs> something to work off. Okay, um, so I'm going to combine this to like, there were three questions about books, books that you think are a must read, books that have changed your life and authors that influence you. I'm going to combine them into one. So um, I'm going to start with you, Helen. Of course you are. Yeah, yep. you put me on the spot because that means I'll say less. Um, <laughs> So, uh, books no, that you think are must read or changed your life um, or influence your work? Uh, okay, I don't think there are any must read books. So I'm like, read whatever interests you. Um, nah, there are no books or authors that influence me stylistically, uh, but I find certain authors very motivating. Mm-hmm. Um, and the book that changed my life, wait for it. <laughs> Midnight Sun. I knew it! <laughs> <laughs> this is twilight from edward's perspective and i read the leaked copy i um was working in a printing place at the time and i actually printed it out and bound it so i have a bound copy of the years previous to the release um half finished edward version of twilight and i remember sitting incredibly drunk in the kitchen nook under the fairy lights in london and thinking fuck i could do this um, so I did. Mm-hmm. Excellent. How about you, Kerry? Books that you think must read, a book that changed your life, or an author that might influence your work? Um, um, Ursula K. Le Guin changed my life. She, she was um, like, a, uh, like a total master, like a genius. And I, I couldn't, I can't really dream of writing like her, but she definitely, you know, like the dispossessed totally changed how I... Um, you know, my outlook. Um, in terms of, yeah, like Helen said, I, I don't think there are any must-read authors, but there are some fucking cool authors in Aotearoa that you should really should try to read, if possible. And Henny Moana Baker, Nina Powell's, Emma Barnes. Emma Barnes is amazing. Um, yeah, probably just read Emma Barnes. And Henny Moana, Nina, so many. But um, Another book that this is probably my most embarrassing um, favorite book, and that I haven't really? finished it, and it, it's so important to me. And uh, it's um, Gorillas in the Mist by Diane Fossey, and I've read like two thirds of it and never have picked it up again. But those two thirds, I think, are just so brilliant. I think Diane Fossey is someone who experienced um, a calling, and if you've seen the Sigourney Weaver film, it, you know, I love Sigourney Weaver. I love that film. My mum showed it to me far when I was far too young. But um, even that film being brilliant, um, it doesn't do Diane Fossey, the woman, justice. She, 
she had a lot of insights into um, a people living in um, near the Rwandan volcano complex where the mountain gorillas lived. She, um, yeah, just a really amazing woman. I think about her all the time in terms of um, my work in um, ecological education and um, kaitiaki tanga and yeah. I love that. <laughs> okay, Issa, I saw you holding up books. Hold up your books. Tell us what's a must read, what changed your life and what authors you love. Um, so this is a deranged book <laughs> called Sea Witch by Neva, Neva Angeline North, who's a trans person from the States. And it's just like this crazy poetry confessional thing that has like characters with deranged names and it's really good. Um, and then just quickly, uh, yeah, How to Make a Basket by Jazz Money is incredible. They're a queer um, First Nations person from Australia. Um, I love this book with my whole heart, um, Science Between um, by Kerry Hume. Yes. Um, and it's, yeah, it was their first poetry collection. Um, and it's just really beautiful. Nature Poem by Tommy Pico. They're a Native American poet, um, really queer. And they wrote a whole book about how they hate nature poems. <laughs> and it is also a nature poem. So yeah. Um, and then lastly, Robert Sullivan, um, Voice Carried My Family, um, has like my favorite short poem that I've ever read in it. Um, yeah. What's the title? What's the your favorite short poem? Um, it to us if it's short. Oh, uh, uh, where is it? Oh, I can't even find it. Okay, we'll go to Lil and we'll come back to you, Issa, okay? Mm, yeah. Lil, tell us about your, <laughs> and your authors. Um, I, I don't think I can, yeah, the difficult, I'm going to just uh, choose to answer parts of that question. Um, I think I like love the books that I that you know make me make me cry or leave me with a, a feeling. I think the one one that I read recently that I loved was Milk Fed by Melissa Broder, which is just kind of like describe it like a weird, horny kind of book. Um, I loved her tone of voice in it, um, so that was pretty cool. And it's got it's a um, it's got a queer relationship in it, but it's quite weird and lovely. Um, I do really love Marion Keyes because I think she handles a bunch of characters well and, and writes with humour um, well and you just it's so easy to read so I, I do kind of want to take some of that from her for my own writing. Um, I've also uh, read this memoir a couple of years ago that was great, We've Always Been Here, it's a queer, a queer Muslim memoir, it was really great. Um, just, uh, just you know, a perspective that's very different to my own, you know, as a white woman in New Zealand. Um, the, the classic, we can't go past Stone Butch Blues, um, which is, um, yeah, uh, about growing up as kind of a non-binary person in, you know, in the States in the 50s and 60s, and it kind of covers like the underground lesbian bars, and it's like desperately sad at, at times and beautiful, and um, you can actually get this... Um, as a downloadable PDF that the author made available. So if anyone wants it, you can, it's really hard to find in print because it's out of print, but you can download the PDF. Um, and then I just grabbed a few on my way downstairs. This is one of my favorite of recent times. It's a manga. Um, so you read it backwards. Um, uh, my Lesbian Experience of Loneliness. And it's a series um, that the other one's my solo diary, I think. And it's about this very lonely, um, woman in, J in Japan who uh, lives it's a it's a memoir um, who, who lives with their parents and is depressed and very anxious and has never been kissed never really been hugged and um, she just decides to go to you know to it's not really about this but she decides to go and sleep with the, a sex worker but it's actually all about she basically writes about writing writing the book so she it's kind of references what she's trying to do and how she just doubts herself the whole way through and it's really beautiful and sad and it's kind of the book I, I thought that's the kind of vulnerabilities that that I would like to capture mm -hmm. um I just love how vulnerable it is um but also just just super compelling so yeah that that's some of my favorite favorites of recent times yeah I love that. I love that you brought like examples. I love it. <laughs> um, okay, back to Issa. Did you find your poem? Yeah, um, it's three lines. Um, the crackling page. My poetry is a fire. If I close my mouth, I will die. Ooh. I like that. Yeah. Awesome. 
Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next question while I process that. What was the, <laughs> sorry, what was the name of that book, Issa, of the um, collection? Vo Voice Carried My Family um, by okay. Robert Sullivan. Yeah. Cool. While Chelsea's processing, um, Kerry, Gorillas in the Mist, have you seen Jane Goodall speak ever? Different um, great ape, but she's also amazing. Yeah, I haven't. She um, visited Tamara Atane when I, uh, Zelandia Sanctuary when I was um, working there, but i um too bashful uh, to uh, approach her. But I, yeah, I, I know there are so many um, brilliant um, people and working in um, conservation and um, kaitiakitanga, even in Aotearoa, there are a lot of great communicators. Um, I, I don't know too much about Jane. But I'm, no, so the, I think there was an orangutan woman yeah. and, um, from We're Germany and then there was Jane and then there yeah. was Diane Fossey and I'm, I'm definitely a... Um, a you can find a lecture on the talk she's done. Um, we saw her at Kristen's school because she turned up for like a... I don't know if it was like a paid thing as a fundraiser for the school, but because my best friends are uh, biology teachers, I get to go along on things and pretend that I also teach biology, which I don't. Um, and likewise, I got into the museum a few times saying that I'm a, a bio teacher. Um, don't tell the museum, I'm sorry, oh my God. Um, but she was amazing. And she started off talking about how as a person, nobody expected anything of her because she was a woman. And she was like, well, that's ridiculous. So she just did whatever she wanted and everyone was like, oh, but, she, but you're a woman. And she's like, yes, I've noticed that earlier. Yes, I checked. Um, and she was absolute massive storyteller. That was just like, she was so good at it. And she had this tiny little toy that she carried around, a little orangutan, I think chimpanzee, chimpanzee. Now I'm getting my grade eight mixed up, but that's fine anyway. Okay, <laughs> okay. I've processed, thank you. <laughs> um, so is there a time that you branched out from your normal style, genre, character, et cetera, and really liked it? Um, Issa, I wanna start with you, cause I'm curious. Well, Echidna is that for me. Um, I was like, how to, how to write poems in third person? Like that seems like a, like it's, it has been done and it has been done a lot, but it hadn't been done a lot by me. And I was like, what, what if I'm not writing about myself? What if I write a book where I feel okay uh, with inviting my parents to the launch or having them read it, um, which is not the case of Ransack. Um, yeah, and it was, it was really fun. And I find it really hard to actually write uh, in first person now, um, which I'm doing with, I started writing a novel and it's in first person. I'm like, this feels wrong. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, have you ever thought about going into playwriting or anything like that? Uh, yeah, I've had conversations with a friend about turning uh, a kid into a play, but that's, yeah, I'm not going to talk about that more. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Lil, how about you? Um, I mean, I've definitely had some massive fails of trying to write in a style that wasn't me, I think. Um, I think it's quite, into, but I haven't really had much, uh, any formal writing training really, and, and certainly not in, in writing books, but I've been to a couple of like short courses at writers festivals and stuff and, you know, creative writing tasks that they give you just terrify me. You know, like there was one that I was in that was like, you know, write a letter to the moon or something. And I'm like, this is my worst nightmare. And immediately tried to you know write write in a voice that was literary and fancy and and then you know of course everyone else read read out their things and they were just you know it didn't have to be fancy it was actually could be simple and I, I find I find a struggle if I um when I'm trying to write something an essay or, or anything I sometimes will go you're just trying too hard to be fancy just like it's okay that your writing is is quite simple and um it's just it's the, it's the, you know I, I know what the strengths are and I feel like if I stray away from my strengths then um, of course it's good to challenge yourself but I can I can tell when I'm going off the rails and I, I feel like I have to come back to be true to myself and maybe that's just my level of experience um, so that's in terms of like style and, and voice and stuff but in terms of things to write I love trying different things um, trying different you know um, 
types of types of writing and copywriting you have to write all kinds of different things and all kinds of tones of voice and you're writing scripts and headlines and um you know emails and letters and interactive tools and stuff so that's fun and so I really usually each year try and give myself a project to try a different kind you know whether it's a play or an essay or a a fiction or whatever and I think that's that's pretty fun to do to try and figure out the rules of something I used to do that with poems Mm. I find a really 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 hard like rhyme scheme um correct me if there's a there's like a thing you know how there are certain poems you got to do a certain amount of things style we're gonna go with style I'd find a style that looked really hard and I would treat it like a puzzle Mm. and just you know make it work yeah I think poetry and short stories are the, my two areas that I would not be good at at all. Um, yeah. But, I read a short story in second person once. That was hell. Mm. Would you venture into something like children's book writing or anything like that? Yeah, I definitely love to. I've got like an idea that I've always wanted to do, but I don't want to be one of those people that go, oh, I'll just write a children's book. It's short and it's easy because the moment you start talking to children's book authors and and start trying to write a children's book you realize that they're actually very very hard to write and um which is you know achieving simplicity is is complex Mm -hmm. um it's it's hard so um yeah I would definitely love to try that for sure okay how about you Kerry have you branched out from your normal style I think I'm very much still developing my style um I, I don't mean this in a um I, I don't see this as a negative, but I, you know, I'm a very slow-brained person. I, um, I, I, um, like I, um, yeah, I just take my time with things. So, I've pub- like Lamplighter was published, and then like I've had a few stories published here and there. But um, I feel feel like I'm still very much in a um, period of discovery, <laughs> uh, and maybe that won't ever end. But. <laughs> um, I, you know, I would like to, um, and this might sound kind of stupid, but um, I'm reading the Animorphs books at the moment, and <laughs> um, I've never really dabbled in fan fiction, so, you know, like, I, I would, ma- maybe I would like to do that, maybe I would like to extend on a, um, on a um, series or a, like a canon that I feel really passionate about, like, I like forgot to even bring my own book over here with me, let alone, like, um, uh, like some of the authors I was talking about, but I do have an Animorphs um, <laughs> uh, book right beside me. So there we go. <laughs> Animorphs oh, yeah. fan fiction. So when you start doing your, your fan fiction, you're going to share your AO3 handle, right? I didn't even know what this is, but sure, I'll share it. <laughs> it's a fan fiction writing site, so we'll all be interested to see that. I want to read some <laughs> Animorphs fan fiction. That sounds awesome. Maybe there's already quite a lot of it. Oh, <laughs> That book series was very popular amongst people who were children a, a longish time ago, and now they're not children anymore, and they are allowed to write smut. <laughs> I've, I've I've heard that there is animal furry fan fiction and animal trans fan fiction. Yeah. So good allegories. Yeah. Don't don't let that put you off, Kerry. There's always room for more. That's the beauty of fan fiction. Oh, there's no, like, there's no gatekeepers. I'm very much like approaching animals as like I'm very interested in the kind of like trans undertones in terms of um animals as a series but maybe not so much um uh like a furry furry fan fiction but you know like different strokes for different folks mm-hmm. we don't yuck anybody else's yum as long as it's consensual right folks <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay Helen over to you have you ever branched out from your normal style yeah, that, that's how I ended up writing a YA book. Um, and it was an experiment, and it went obviously really well. Um, and now I have to write another one. Mm-hmm. Yep, mm-hmm. you do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move into some of the questions that we've got. I've, had, I've received a couple in messages while we've been running. So I'm going to start with a question from Nico. So they asked, uh, how does one go about finding people to help them publish a book? Um, Helen, we'll start with you. Enter a random competition that you find on the internet at midnight. Mm -hmm. Kerry, how about you? Hello. (laughs) Um, I think you so covered this really well 
um, earlier. So I'm sorry if I'm stealing what you're about to say, sir. But you know, like when you um, are like, uh, you know, when you do undergrad papers or when you um, get involved in a creative writing school somehow, you meet a lot of people. The um, the workshopping experience for me at the IIML was like just so fucking good. Like I, my best friend I met in the um, in the um, in my year and we share each other we share writing with each other every week or try to frequently um, but yeah and just get involved in your local community there's um, uh, most like most cities that, that I've lived in in Aotearoa I have um, you know like there are people interested in writing and there are book launches I went to a couple of really cool book launches in um, Rotorua I, I mean you know I was only there for nine months I think McLeod's bookshop um, obviously, Te Whanganui Atara has a really abundant um, writing scene, whether or not you like are studying. Um, yeah. Esa, did that step on what you were going to say? Oh, I, I, yeah, I was, I was basically just going to repeat myself. Like, um, yeah. there's like a clear kind of pipeline through universities, but that's also for specific kind of writing, like um all the big publishers left New Zealand uh I don't know when exactly that happened but like they, they still publish New Zealand writers but none of them are based in New Zealand anymore so like Penguin um for example um offices here they've got offices but they ship everything they print in even America or, or England and then they ship them over yeah that's to do um, with I think more the financial side of it yeah they store them in big warehouses in Australia because there's yeah. no to do it mm. um but like, yeah, there, there's always, I think they're always looking for the submissions of things. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I, I'll talk when you're finished. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so there's like a lot of, there's a lot of publishers that are like have open, open submissions um, and, you know, reading books they publish and seeing what they like. And yeah, I think that's like a, a good thing to be doing and always like sending stuff off places. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's me. <laughs> Okay, Helen, what did you want to say? I was going to elaborate on that, that yes, there are also the words. Um, there are a lot of publishers in New Zealand that are open for submissions and New Zealand is one of the few places where you don't need an agent to do that. Mm -hmm. You just 100% need to follow their instructions on their website about submissions. Um, yeah. That, that's all I was going to add because I it took me ages to figure that out I was like trying to look for an agent because all the advice online was like get an agent but all that advice is coming from mostly America and England and, and places such as that um and it wasn't until I talked to a friend of mine at another social hobby group uh and he said that he knew someone who worked at Penguin and that I should ask her if I needed a agent Thank you. Um, and so I emailed her and I said, do I need an agent? And she was like, oh, no, absolutely not. New Zealand's like real chill. <laughs> what do you mean by where's the websites? <laughs> um, I can I can help answer that. So I get a lot of um, author inquiries through our website asking us whether we've got any publisher contacts. We do if you want to buy some books, but in terms of publishing, not really. Um, so there are a few really good sites online that I've redirected people through to. So publishers.org.nz has a list of all of the publishers that are part of the Publishers Association of New Zealand and how you can get in contact with them in terms of um, submitting works. Um, and there's also a good list on, um, there's a choose your publisher guide, which sort of tells you what publishers in New Zealand, what they're kind of looking for. Um, so yeah, search NZ Publishers on Google and you'll find some websites. But sorry, Lil, I didn't mean to cut you out of that conversation. Do you have any Oh, no, that, that's super valuable. Um, yeah, I think it's just do when you find the publishers, look at, look at what they publish and they're usually quite clear about what they don't publish because you'll, you know, and then, and then do follow their submission guidelines strong, you know, that, that they say this is what that I want because if you can show that you submit exactly what they've asked for and it's all tidy and, you know, run it through spell check and stuff, that's super important to give the impression. Um, yeah, but... Display a basic level of literacy. 
<laughs> yeah but also it's not just about um finding a publisher like there are you know literary journals and websites and um that you can if you want if you want to write other things or short stories or essays and things like that you know the, the spin-off takes essays and we've got some great magazines Takahe and Landfall and the Pantograph Punch and all, all kinds of places and um, Bad Apple is a new one and they're always taking um new writers on board yeah that that's yeah Bad Apple gay right well that's their mm-hmm. Instagram thing so queer stuff so yeah just um and they're and then yeah just keep an eye out like follow people on Twitter and and see you know what comes up as opportunities I I got um, not that a kiss girl published because I sent it to Alan and Unwin's um, Friday submissions, which was literally just followed their instructions and sent it to them on a Friday. And um, yeah, so you never know. You don't always have to have connections. Hmm. Like I don't have any. <laughs> I do now, but I didn't. Um, uh, I know that Harper Collins does a, I think they do theirs on Wednesday, hmm. um, but they did have open submissions. Um, yeah that's all I had to add also you know um self-publishing you are allowed to do Mm. yeah there are definitely downsides to being published with a big publisher and you have to do a lot of work yourself anyway yeah I remember getting asked so how are you going to be able to promote this book and I'm like I see three people other than the classes I teach, so none. I have nothing. I don't have a TikTok following. But there's there's like one there's like one quite prominent a- agency. You know, Helen was talking about agents in New Zealand that I can think of. And I remember when I was when the book was finished and I was trying to start exploring getting it published. I emailed them and said, "Do you ever represent or, or publish memoirs?" Um, and they said you have to have 200,000 social media followers hmm. to have a memoir published in New Zealand. And I was like, who in New Zealand has got 200,000 Twitter followers? Like, maybe just under a turn. You know, the All Blacks maybe. So, <laughs> you know, even people, you know, people that are inside the industry, they're, you know, people will try and dis- dissuade you from your dreams, but you just have to keep going. So another interesting question that we got that we were having a bit of a kōrero about before we started. Um, do you have any advice for writing characters of minority identities that you are not part of? For example, I am transmasculine. How would I go about writing a transfeminine character? Uh, a so, transfeminine person and ask them all the questions. All yeah, of them. that's what you would do, Helen? Yeah. No, I... Because I feel like I tend to write about guys a lot, but like it's easier to be a bisexual female than it is to be a bisexual male by all things that I have seen in a school for 10 years. Um, and I don't think that's okay. So I feel like the guys need it more at high school age because it's not as common and they might feel like they, they can't because it's not a thing. Um, whereas it's always been kind of interesting for a girl to be bisexual and I, ugh, ugh. Mm. Um, mm. <laughs> so I kind of wanted to write about women, but I was like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do this. How do I, how do I do that? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah. And then a lot of people were asking for a story with Manaya in it from Tim and I'm like, well, she's, she's a lesbian and I'm not. So I don't know. And I just, I went, right, we're going on a lesbian hunt. And I wrote down the list of all the people I knew that were lesbians. I'm like, oh, this is actually a lot of people. I don't know any straight people. That's right. Um, And I talked to them and I was like, is it okay for me to do this? And they're like, yeah, we need more literature out there, please. And I'm like, what are the, the really important things that you think that people don't understand? And I just got this massive outpouring of please write about this issue that I have. And I think that way you stop writing the book for yourself so it's not about the fact that you aren't that person and you're still writing the book you are now writing these characters specifically for people you know Mm. and it becomes like someone else is going to think of the word before me no tribute it becomes a tribute to the people that you know rather than a I made this up and this is all secretly about me um yeah so that is my rambling explanation for what I do 
Okay, Kerry, what about you? Any advice for writing characters of minority identities that you are not a part of? I probably wouldn't write anything from the perspective of a minority group that I, I'm not a part of. Very like interested in um, marginalization and I, I would want there to be marginalized characters in my future works, but I, would, um, I wouldn't write from their perspective. I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. Um, but even in writing um, and having people, marginalized people who in, who I, I don't have those experiences. I, I would try to do, you know, like best research and, you know, maybe talk to people who are from those, um, who are marginalized in those ways. And if I can reimburse them for their time, I guess. So sensitivity readers as well, right? Say that um, again, sorry? Sensitivity readers. Ah, you can you define that for me? I'm not sure if I've heard that. Um, uh, so it's somebody that if if you're including a character of a minority that you're not a part of, a person that belongs to that community, reading it to make sure that you're representing that community in, 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 a, in an accurate light. Oh, wow, you're right. And then and then hopefully reimbursing them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so exactly. Like you do to a, any editor or any like reader. Yeah, yeah. great. What about you, Issa? What do you think? Um, I have this conversation a lot. Uh, with friends about Pākehā writing Māori. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like there's always, you have to engage with the community you're writing about. So like, yeah, talking to people, um, but then also thinking about like the kind of stories that have been told about these people and whether or not you're contributing to more harmful stories um, and whether or not, you know, maybe you just need to help another writer write their own story. Um, yeah, um, but yeah, it is very complicated. But I, I always always think think about the communities that you would be impacting by publishing a story. I think you can just write anything, like you know, in your <laughs> in the in the privacy of your home or whatever. Um, I think it's good to just give yourself that freedom. But um, when you're putting it into the world, I think you need yeah need to think really deeply about the kind of communities you're impacting and who you need to talk to. And yeah, and I think there's also a difference in writing about people like just having Māori in your stories like that's a cool thing because we're here like um, <laughs> um whereas if you're writing like about Māori identity mm -hmm. um then that gets a bit a bit trickier if you you know you're not from that community um yeah I don't know <laughs> that's uh yeah, totally agree answer. <laughs> that's why it was really easy to include side characters from a bunch of minority groups that I would never write from their perspective, though. Whereas Tim is, his dad's Māori, his mum's British, and I'm like, well, that's that's me. So I felt really comfortable doing it, but I still felt nervous going, oh, but God, but what if I haven't represented myself properly? Um, and I did get more people to read it and go, is this, is this okay? Is it okay for me to think this about myself? And it, it was, it was a journey emotionally, but it was worth it. And like, the feedback I've got of kids going, oh my God, there's a Māori main character. And I'm like, yes, yes, we can do it. Hakata boy main character, yes. That too, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, now I got what you meant then, okay. I'm tired and I haven't eaten. <laughs> okay, we're almost there. I've got one question after this one. Lil, what are your thoughts on, on writing outside of the identity you're part of? I think it's all been said. I don't know if I've got much to add but I will say that it's been it's nice to see things like sensitivity readers come um happening in like the corporate world as well that I work in you know we're 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 writing websites and it's there are agencies dedicated to um you know ensuring that it's accurate and that, that it's representing people properly and it, it kind of reminds me of on set on film sets how they have um intimacy coaches now yeah, it's like everyone's just not it. kind of wildly splashing around like you do have to do things um carefully and with um uh, understand your intent which is not as good hopefully we're moving in the right direction it's accountability right mm. okay my last question do you have a favorite word lil i'm gonna start with <laughs> you because you've had the most time to think about it <laughs> well look a disclaimer i don't think it's impossible to have just one but um i do like the word diabolical 
um, because it, yeah, it's one of those words that kind of sounds like the meaning. Um, I like menace, someone yep. who's a menace. Um, uh, and then I, I kind of collect like funny terms and I, I came across one ages ago called heat lag, which is um, how it takes um, you ages to realize that you're queer because of heteronormativity in society. So heat lag. <laughs> so that's good. That would be a great title for a book. Yeah. <laughs> I would read that book. Thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, you, either, any of you any of you can feel free to write a book that is the title I'll, I'll let you have that one we could have it be the name of our anthology that we do together yeah that sounds <laughs> awesome uh Kerry do you have a favorite word um I, I for some reason I really like controversy I really like saying it like controversy rather than controversy mm -hmm. um and yeah I mean I think um very like um integrated into my um into my career in ecological education and um kaitiaki tanga a, a real joy for me was like learning a lot of the names given to um the features of the um, ecological landscape in Aotearoa learning those first names that were um given to the, given by the people who discovered Aotearoa so I mean, I, there are a lot of really nice vowel sounds in um, Te Reo Māori, I think, and for some reason they, they had a pleasure, pleasure centre for me. But um, I really like Pipi Whaurauroa, uh, which is like a, um, if you don't know, it's like a little cuckoo. Um, a titi Ponamu is really beautiful. Um, Tūnaku Faru Faru, which is um, the, the, the the larger of the two eel species here. Yeah, lots of beautiful names in, um, in the ecological landscape of Aotearoa, I reckon. I love it when a word just sits, it feels right when you say it, like whakapanoongatanga for me. Like I, that word feels so beautiful. Um, Essa, how about you, favourite word? Uh, utu at the moment. Um, I like that it's about you know it's about balance um and it's a word that is perfectly balanced <laughs> like yeah. it's a it's a palindrome um yeah that's that's my answer <laughs> amazing and helen i'm going to end it with you what's your favorite word um ostensibly mm. if you're going for english um just because it sounds cool um but in tereo definitely takatapui because it sounds cool and the force of the joy that I had when I found the word and found out all the, the stuff behind it and how it was just normal before colonization. Um, right. It made me feel really good. Like, ah, oh, it was awesome. It was awesome. There may have been tears. <laughs> Um, I just think it, it's a word that means a lot and it sounds beautiful and it gives me hope. Yeah. I, um, my experience of learning that word was um, it actually taught me how the tohutoa works, how the, how the macron works in a word because uh -huh. I just didn't understand what the, you know, you just say emphasis. I'm like, I don't really know what that means. Um, but then hearing, hearing the skuya say takatapu, I was like, oh, huh, there it is. <laughs> Māori is just the most beautiful language to listen to, even if you don't know what's being said. I remember sitting in a shoe shop, and I'm sorry, Chelsea, I know this was not, might, meant to be a nice, neat ending, but I was sitting in a shoe shop in Auckland somewhere, and there were two families behind me, and the two fathers started talking to each other in Tereo, and I was just sitting there trying on a pair of shoes going, I never want to move. I just want to sit here forever and not know what you're saying, but still feel it. And I, that was a little while later. I was like, you know what Google Maps needs to do? They need to get a proper Māori guy. Not that there's any improper Māori guys. That wasn't it. <laughs> um, but get them to read out all of the road directions. Because I would be so much calmer having someone to say that, you know, coming up, we're going to turn left. And then there'll be some really cool trees on the right. <laughs> so make sure you see them. And I just feel like all my road stress would just go away. Just having that, that depth and calm, yeah. For me, I just want the words pronounced correctly. That's um, a great start. That, that gives me so much ire when I'm driving and it's like, oh, you're going through a poor rural. You're like, no, no. 
<laughs> Auckland's okay. lovely because you get to go titty rangi. <laughs> I don't worry. I live in Lovin, so. Oh, I live near Tia Tartal. <laughs> Not okay, completely there. derailed. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, that wraps up. I know there was a couple of questions that I didn't get to, and I'm really sorry about that, but I'm pretty sure that all of the authors would be open to receiving a message from any participants with questions I didn't get to. Yes, I see some nods. I'm going to take it as a yes. All right. Um, this has been a joy. I have really enjoyed doing this. It's been really lovely spending tonight with you. And I'm going to pass you over to Ari. Thanks, Chelsea. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Chelsea. That was wonderful. You did a great job. You also took the pressure off me, which was quite nice. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to I, it sounds so weird because normally at the end of like a panel people clap but we can't clap um so I just wanted to give yeah actually Helen we can all we can all do that um I wanted to say thank you to our authors for coming because that was ah oh, such a great evening um I am so amazed and impressed by everything you had to say and I really wanted to thank everybody for coming um it was lovely it was, to meet you yeah it was really good that you all turned up and your questions that you all submitted was they were fantastic um and i just thought i'd finish with a karakia as we started with one um i apologize in advance if my pronunciation is a little off but we'll do our best so kyoto nama na kitanga atimea naro kirunga kitena kitena otato kia mahia te hua mahi kihi kihi Kia toi, te kupu, toi te mana, toi te aroha, toi te dreo Māori. Kia tuturu, ka whakamoa, kia tina, tina, huye, taikie. Kia ora, everybody. Um, I am pretty sure I've tagged every one of the authors on the Instagram post at Inside Out, so you can all go and like stalk them there and send me your DMs and get their books because if you haven't read all of them, you should. Um, I wrote down so many books that were mentioned today um, by everybody, and now I'm going to have a very big uh, bill, but that's fine. Um, it's great. Uh, again, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your evening. Helen, I hope you go and get some kai. Um, I will also be doing the same thing, and um, I'll see you all on the flip side. Thank you, Ari. Thank you for making the space. Kakite. Kakite.